In extensive stage small cell lung cancer, we often see actually very good responses to therapy uh, with initial treatment. And so historically, if we look at uh, prior to any of the checkpoint inhibitors and such, a uh, front line of just chemotherapy, uh, carboplatin or cisplatin and etoposide, uh, we see the majority of patients having responses. And, and in some people, we see very dramatic responses in, in, in uh, the most extreme case I've had is somebody who was actually in the intensive care unit and intubated who ended up having an excellent response to therapy and ultimately was back to outpatient living his life and, and very active. And it's not uncommon to see people admitted to the hospital with a new diagnosis of small cell lung cancer needing oxygen that have responses to the initial chemotherapy such that they're able to uh, leave off of oxygen and, and, and kind of somewhat back to their lives, um, although, of course, they then have ongoing treatment uh, and such. But the initial responses can be very significant. The challenge, though, becomes when there's progression of disease. And, and unfortunately for many people, that really comes uh, within months and in, in many cases can be less than six months. And there the treatment options really become uh, much more limited. If it's been more than six months, then trying chemotherapy again, the platinum side can sometimes be effective. And I, and I have seen some patients with responses in that situation. Unfortunately, there have been a lot of failed trials within small cell lung cancer. It's just been a very difficult disease to control and a very aggressive disease. And so in the second line and beyond, we've seen a number of treatments not really uh, demonstrate efficacy. I think the most disappointing recently has been Rova-T. This was a drug with tremendous preclinical data. There was a lot of hype and a lot of enthusiasm about this drug that unfortunately didn't really pan out in the studies that we've seen. The regimen that I've used most commonly really is carboplatin AUC of five on day one, etoposide 100 milligrams per meter squared on days one, two, and three with Q3 week cycles. Uh, I would do scans every two cycles and um, typically at that first scan after two cycles, often see a nice response to therapy. And, and those are and tend to be happier visits where people are very excited to see how much the cancer has uh, really shrank. Um, after four cycles is where often um, it hasn't necessarily changed so much. And so there's usually some stability between those two scans. In those who are continuing to have a nice response to therapy, who had really done well with the first four cycles, I would then consider giving them cycles five and six uh, of therapy. And that really is a min minority of patients. Um, it, it, so this was really in the pre-immunotherapy time frame of using just chemotherapy. That, that's really the regimen that I would use. With the Empower 133 data, we saw with um, chemotherapy adding in atezolizumab for four cycles and then maintenance atezolizumab, we saw improvements in progression-free survival and overall survival, albeit minimal. I think the important thing was that we saw an increase in durable responses. And with a disease that is so deadly when there's progression, those durable responses become incredibly meaningful. And so this has really become the standard of care, chemotherapy plus atezolizumab uh, in the frontline setting. So this is a regimen I've adopted as frontline therapy, carboplatin, etoposide plus atezolizumab. Now I'll point out that I don't necessarily give atezolizumab for everybody with the first cycle. If someone's admitted to the hospital, um, I think it's fine to just start the chemotherapy and add in the atezolizumab when they're an outpatient with the second line. Um, I've also had situations of patients where we're considering whether or not to add in radiation. So whether we're gonna treat them as limited stage or extensive stage and they're kind of on the fence uh, between those where I've sometimes held the atezolizumab initially uh, as while we're doing that initial uh, determination. I'll say that um, what we see with the curves within the Empower uh, 133 study is the separation of those curves really ends up being later on. So I think it's okay to, to not give the atezolizumab with that, front, with that first cycle if there's, if there's good reason for that uh, and just to add it in as quickly as you can uh, depending on the course of events.